Hello and welcome to this tutorial and today we're going to look at a Marantz PM44 SE amplifier. This amplifier was extremely popular and even now you can pick them up from auction websites at a relatively low cost. And what I would say is if you do spend the time and you do the work which I'm going to sort of run through here, you will be rewarded with a with a good quality amplifier, you know, tremendous sound quality as all of these Moran series of amplifiers of this time period and um, let's just take a look at the general specification so in terms of power output the amplifier will deliver 40, 54 watts into 8 ohm load but what's interesting is that you can go to 80 watts and then that's at a 4 ohm load or it will actually deliver 100 watts into a 2 ohm load so that, that's that's pretty impressive right and then frequency response is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz and then total harmonic distortion is 0.15 percent and this amplifier does support a moving magnet input for phono connection and typical input voltage there is 2.5 millivolts and then for all of the other input sensitivity you're looking at 154 millivolts and we typically refer to these as the line inputs and as we said it supports a moving magnet cartridge video input, tuner, tape, auxiliary and also DDC which you can select them from the front and then it's quite a heavy amplifier coming in at 10 kilograms and dimension wise you're talking 420 by 118 and 280 uh, millimeters overall. Now as per some of the other video tutorials that I've done these types of amplifiers really just have age related issues this one came in and very common it said intermittent loss of sound and sometimes the customer will report for example if they just moved the input selection switch backwards and forwards then they could probably recover the sound and but then you know it would then be lost again or they may also experience some level of distortion now with this series of amplifier that type of issue can be twofold it can either be associated with the input selection switch and this is very very common for any type of amplifier of this age that uses these types of switches and you'll see that in a moment in the video and it can also be attributed to the speaker output protection relays as well you know these amplifiers have been in operation for decades and that means a lot of switching of the contacts and delivering you know current into these speakers so they become tarnished and they also become corroded and pitted over time so they become resistive and that's really what you're facing here. So when you have an input selection switch, which is heavily oxidized onto the coating of the switch mechanism, then a low level signal coming maybe from the final stage, when it gets connected into there, although it's been slightly amplified, you will still get some distortion. So what we're showing here in the video is the input selection switch, and then the speaker protection relay was already re or was, was replaced as well. But as I've said many, many times, you need to take a systematic approach. So what happens with these series of amplifiers, and I appreciate for people who are regular subscribers, this seems a little bit like repetition. Um, but for new people who have maybe just arrived on the channel, or you have a PM44SE, then you know you can you can follow along here. So in terms of service manual, then you can use the PM40SE service manual. There is a supplement which is about a four page document that just covers the 44 SE but just use the 40 SE for your service schematic and then it also will give you details as well as how to adjust the bias and again we'll come back to that a little bit later on and your bias millivoltage here would be set to 14 millivolts. So first thing to do is always take this systematic approach that I described so just do a visual check and as you see from this amplifier you know it had a lot of dust. So I've got to get in there both with a compressed air line and also with a long uh, brush just to clear that out. And you have the initial clean, but as you start to remove each one of the circuit boards, then there will be more of a thorough clean then because I also need to clean the chassis and um, also the front fascia when that's removed. When you remove the back cover plate, and again I've repeated this in other tutorials, you'll see that when you get to the speakers, when you remove the four fixing screws that screw through, you'll notice that there's no paint. It's bare aluminium, and that's done for a reason. There is a common ground point on the speaker terminals. So when you put the screw through the back plate, it of course makes contact with the bare metal, 
and then it also screws into this ground connection and the main amp board uses a common ground if you don't put the screws in there and you power the amplifier up it will destroy the output stage of the amp so you don't want to be doing that of course so even during test phase put the back panel on insert the screws to create a common ground and then you'll then also need to put one or two screws in to secure the back panel to the overall chassis okay so absolutely a must once that back panel is removed what I do is I unplug the input selection boards and then you can disconnect the ribbon cables and just pull them up and they unclip and then I just put the amp board or the main amp chassis to the side and then I'm focusing on the dry solder joints and there always will be dry solder joints so I'll flow solder all the RCA input connectors but I'm also taking a detailed look at the multi-pin connectors where the ribbon cables come in and out to connect to other parts of the amp and I'm resoldering all of those it is common to find dry joints and once I've done that part of the amplifier so that's the final input board and then also the line input boards I then focus on the main amp board now on the bottom of these amplifiers you have a service plate and you can remove it if you wish but you won't get full access to the whole of the board so when you look from the top you have four fixing screws and then there's some metal tabs just towards the front so use a long flat blade screwdriver and just push them out of the way and then there's just a PCB mount so you just squeeze that in with a pair of pliers and then you can lift the board up then now what I'm also showing in the video is probably the most common fault when these amplifiers were manufactured they go onto a flow solder machine so the boards pass over molten solder and then with flux it then coats the, the pins of the, of the components it's not a huge amount of solder so over time and if they've been stressed or they have some form of mechanical stress you'll see this black or sort of gray circle appear so you can see the solder joint starts to crack now with these series of amplifiers you need to focus on the main output transistors and I'm showing this here but also on the voltage amplifier transistor which is also mounted onto the heatsink you'll always find these dry solder joints and it could mean that the it blows the input protection fuse which is a T1.6 amp fuse or in some cases it doesn't it just simply goes into protection mode or the customer will report you know sort of random issues there this amplifier had had a lot of use so I also look at the amp board and again shown just reflow all of the connections that you can see on there where they're starting to become brittle grey or you see any form of cracking around them and then what I then do is I then replace the speaker protection relay as well so that's a 24 volt double pole changeover relay so I'm taking out you know a potential issue from the older relay and also have a look at the speaker connection terminals as well so this is where they solder onto the board just make sure there's no cracked dry joints there and then on the common grounding point which I referred to previously what you'll find is that there is a brass eyelet which connects through onto the heat sink make sure that you solder that because you could find dry solder joints on there this amplifier didn't have the issue with the brown glue what they've done on this version is they've used a different type of glue which doesn't go conductive or corrosive but you will find many of the PM series amplifiers have this brown glue and often it's coating in the area of the protection circuit here they've used a white type almost like a silicon rubber just to provide this additional support to the components and then as I said the other issue here was due to the input selection switch so what you can do it's like a ribbon cable type switch so you can just unclip it that's the mechanism from the front face your back and then I just desolder the switch and just make sure you get the correct orientation so you might want to take a few photographs if this is the first time that you've done this and then I just use a fiberglass pencil to clean it all up and you can see a before and after shot and the area where would be the connection for the phono input signal it's very very heavily oxidized so no wonder the, the customer has seen the, the issue there so once that is then done I'll move then to the power supply input board again remove the two fixing screws lift it up and then I'm looking mechanically where the on off switch comes in so I'm resoldering into there and then make sure that's all good and then the last point of call is the tone board which is connected to the front fascia very very easy to remove so it's just three screws that you access from the top and then you have two fixing screws on the top of the chassis which connect the front bezel to the the main amp chassis uh, metal and then 
once you move that out of the way, if you look from the rear, you'll find that there's two um, countersunk screws which go into the switch mechanism for the uh, tone control bypass circuit and then the DDC and then the tape input selector. And then you'll also find a, again, uh, a non-countersunk screw which goes onto the mount for, this, for the input for the headphone socket. So when you see in the video, you'll see that there's often again dry solder joints on the headphone socket. Now remember this is a switch socket. So you could get issues with intermittent loss of sound because there's dry joints on there. Reflow it. Reflow also those selection switches. You'll find there's very little solder on there. And then the final part is the balance control. For this amp, the balance control was noisy, which is unusual because it's a type 10, it's very, very small. But I did have to disassemble it and then spray deoxy in there and then clean it up. It's a little bit fiddly because it is quite small. But once it was then reinstalled, I just checked it with a multimeter just to make sure it was, was all good before I resoldered it into there. And then I also focus on the volume control potentiometer as well. So you'll find often dry joints on that volume pot and then the interconnecting cable sockets. Resolder all of those. And then once you've done that, then you can also use deoxy to spray directly into those selection switches, the headphone socket, and also the volume control as well. And just rotate it back and forwards or operate the switches multiple times just to get the contacts nice and clean in there. And then they will then be noise free. And then once I've done all of that, what you then do is you just reassemble, of course, the amplifier and then come back to the point about this grounding plate. Now, what I show in the video is an, act, an extract from the 40 series or, or 40 SE service manual. And this schematic is shown both the left and right channel output. And just to the right hand side, you can just about see the speaker protection relay coil. And then you can see that there's a back EMF protection diode. But what I'm highlighting with the arrows are two things. The first one, when you look at the left hand side, you can see the bias potentiometers. So there's one for each channel. And as I've said before, it's good practice just to spray those presets. And then you can then just rotate them back and forth with the amplifier turned off, just back and forth, and then just move them back to their roughly their original position. And you're just cleaning off any oxidization from the carbon track so when you come to make the adjustment then it will be a lot smoother rather than maybe it just has been there for the last 30 years and you break contact and then you reach maybe a, a dirty part of the, the, the slide track which could you know result in excess miller voltage because it drives the pre-driver stage and then output stage too hard so that is what you want to be doing there and then what you'll look at are the emitter resistors and they're shown so the emitter resistors have extended leads so you can clip on and again I show this just some hook clips back to your multimeter and then what you want to do there is apply the power of course to the amplifier and then you're just monitoring what that milli voltage looks like so this is with no input signal connected no speakers connected and then volume control at minimum and balance control at center point or, or mid position and then I'll leave the amplifier just to warm up. If, if it's a little bit high initially, don't worry about that. Just back it off, you know, so even if it goes down to maybe five or six millivolts, that's perfectly fine because you're in adjustment phase. And then once the amp's warmed up for about 10 or 15 minutes, what I'll then do is I will then adjust the millivoltage across the emitter resistors until I have a reading of 14 millivolts. And then once I've adjusted it to 14 millivolts, then you know I'll leave the amplifier running probably for about an hour and then I just run the amplifier under test then so that's where I'm running some test audio into it and then of course I can connect the scalp up and run a sine wave but based on experience you know sometimes you don't have to need to go to all of that because you can just say hear the sound quality you can pick up with your own ears if there's any levels of distortion or crossover distortion so once you've done all of the testing as I said before in previous tutorials, the only other thing to do is simply just clean the amplifier up. And then that's a two stage, so I just use like a plastic base, like a UPVC type plastic base, non aggressive cleaner that takes the initial off. And then I'll just use a secondary cleaner, then just to remove any sort of grease uh, from, the, from the case. Sometimes what you'll find is that these amplifiers or any amplifier may have some damage to the chassis where the uh, paint has been you know scuffed off 
Um, what you can purchase are water-based enamel and they're ultra fast drying and you can get these in various colors so sometimes a matte may match the chassis or sometimes the gloss base and then this amplifier has a couple of scuffs dead simple just run a little bit of the bit of the enamel type paint in there and come back after 20 minutes and you'll find that it's completely rock solid and it's barely even noticeable then and as I said, if you purchase these amplifiers, you're going to pick up a very, very good amplifier. Follow this tutorial through in terms of service work. And then once you've done all of that, as I say, you're going to be rewarded with a very, very nice amplifier. So that brings us to the end of this tutorial. So I thank you again for stopping by and for listening. And if you have any questions at any time, you can, of course, email audio amplifier servicing at AOL.com. And I'll be more than happy then to respond back to you and provide any assistance. I sort of make the point as well that since I've been doing these tutorials, uh, I've seen a, a definite uplift in, in the engagement level. And also as well, I've got a lot of good feedback, you know, from people who've repaired a lot of amplifiers themselves. Based on what you're seeing here, I appreciate some of the older videos don't have a tutorial. But as I said, it is a knowledge base. So you're going to be told exactly what component to change. And, you know, with over a million plus views on the channel, I'm quite convinced that people have saved a huge amount of money by repairing the amps. And no doubt there's also repair specialists out there who have not spent hours fault finding. They've used the, uh, the, the database that I've created here to quickly fault find and then rectify and repair and restore and amplify it back. All right, so thank you very much. Until the next time. Bye-bye.